Aloha, once again. My name is Ann Smoke. I'm with the, Center for the Judiciary Center for Alternative Dispute Resolution. And before we get started with today's program, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. First, please note that Alolo is filming. So out of respect to our panelists and our moderator, and in the case that, um, that they will catch your, your phone ringing, please silence any personal devices right now. Thank you. Also, uh, you're going to find index cards at your seat. I have my props up here. They look like this. Because Alelo is filming and we want to capture the questions, Cecilia Chang will be reading the questions that come in. So we're going to ask you to write the questions on the index cards. And if our ushers will raise their hands, we have some terrific students from the Columbia School of Law and from the Spark Matsunaga Institute for Peace, they will be your ushers and they'll be walking up and down the aisles. So just hold your card up so we can see it and we'll make sure it gets into the right hands. We're planning to be here until 4.15 today and we don't have any scheduled breaks. Uh, however, if you need a stretch break or if you have to take care of business, please step out the back door. Jacqueline, can you raise your hand? Step out that back door there, and you can go around. You can sit down in the lounge, have refreshment if you'd like. There are restrooms on the upper level at the top of the stairs and below the staircase. We appreciate feedback. You're going to also find green forms at your seat. Those are evaluation forms. Please take time to fill that out before you leave. We, we would love to hear from you and any suggestions or feedback that you have. There are feedback boxes. The evaluation boxes are going to be in the foyer as you exit or in the small registration table that you might have seen when you came in. So please leave your forms uh, with us, your evaluations. Last of all, if you're requesting CLE credits, please make sure that you've signed in. And on your way, way out, sign out at the same station, because that's where you'll find your name. It'll be expedient that way. And if everything goes as planned, we'll hand you a CLE certificate on your way out the door. So with those important details taken care of, I'd like to turn over the podium to Cecilia Chang, the director for the Center for Alternative Dispute Resolution, and she'll start our program. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to the Circuit Court of the Second Circuit, Maui, who is joining us by webcast. Last fall, an ambitious third-year law student from Columbia Law School's Mediation Clinic came home for the holidays. During her vacation break, she reached out to the Hawaii Alternative Dispute Resolution, or ADR, organizations to develop a learning partnership. Cindy Lee explained that Columbia Law School's Mediation Clinic equips students with problem solving and conflict resolution skills applicable both within the legal profession and beyond, and that the clinic explores ADR best practices and when ADR is an appropriate alternative to formal legal adjudication. Cindy invited us to partner with prominent ADR scholars from Columbia Law School on an educational forum. That exciting initial discussion grew into a two-day educational exchange starting with this panel discussion, a talk story later this evening on best practices, and a talk tomorrow at UH on multilateral negotiation, tools for conflict resolution and prevention. This evening's talk story is full but there are seats available for tomorrow's talk at UH. Kindly uh, grab a flyer on your way out. It's just outside the door. We thank our co-sponsors, whose leaders are right here in the front row. Columbia Law School, well, Cindy Lee and the other students back there, and of course, Professor Sean Watts, and Professor Alex Carter. We thank the Hawaii State Bar Association Alternative, Alternative Dispute Resolution Section co-chairs Lisa Jacobs, Dick Mosier, and Gary Grimmer. The Native Hawaiian Bar Association, Kapono right there in the front, B.D. Dawson, Euclid Aluli, Summer Silva, Sissy Farm, and Dexter Kayama. The Association for Conflict Resolution Hawaii, Amrita Malik, Lisa Nakao, the Mediation Center of the Pacific, Tracy Wilkin, up here in the front, and the Spark Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, Maya Soitoro Ng and Jose Barzola. Thank you all for your dedication and energy in promoting ADR. 
Thank you also to my team, Anne, Becky, David, and Memory, and the many volunteers, including judiciary staff, students from Columbia Law School, and the Spark Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Let me now have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished guest speakers. I'd like to begin with Malia Akutagawa, Assistant Professor of Law and Professor of Hawaiian Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She will speak from, will speak from experience as a former litigator turned advocate for proactively engaging people in traditional practices to mitigate problems that end up in court. I'd also like to introduce Euclid Aluli. Euclid will provide invaluable insight as a native Hawaiian attorney and activist who defends Hawaiian rights within the legal system. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Sean Watts. Professor Watts, Sean, is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Omaha. He's a lecturer in law and associate director of the Columbia Law School Mediation Clinic. Professor Watts specializes in mediation and Native American peacemaking and will discuss Native American models and practices. I'd like to introduce Laulani Teo. Laulani has a wealth of experience in cultural-based conflict resolution in Hawaii. She will speak through her lens, having worked in Ho'oponopono extensively and having guided parties to resolution in disputes relating to Native Hawaiian rights. For more information about our esteemed panelists, please see their detailed biographies in the program. Our moderator today is the president and CEO of Epic Ohana a nonprofit organization serving families in the child welfare system and vulnerable transitioning youth. Many of you know her from her 12 years as the Associate Dean for Student Services at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Or perhaps you know her as your professor from the Family Law Clinic. Or <laughs> you might have known her because she coordinated and co-founded the Kids First program at the Family Court of the First Circuit as well as the Ohana Conferencing Program of the Department of Human Services and the Family Court. She practiced family law for over a decade, mostly as a solo practitioner in Waipahu. Her awards are many. I've just abbreviated four pages of awards into number one, now she's getting embarrassed, the Hawaii State Bar Association's Golden Gavel Award the Volunteer Legal Services of Hawaii New Award, the Hawaii Women Lawyers Distinguished Service Award, the Hawaii Women Lawyers Foundation Rhoda Lewis Community Service Award, and the William S. Richardson School of Law Alumni Association Service Award. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Lori Tochiki. Before we begin, however, I now have the pri privilege of introducing our Chief Justice, of the Hawaii Supreme Court, who will give some context to our discussion today, the Honorable Mark E. Rechtenwald. CJ. Good afternoon. Aloha, everyone. Welcome to Ali'i Olani Hale, the home of the Hawaii Supreme Court. We're honored to have you in our courtroom here today, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here for this very important discussion. Almost a year ago, I had the privilege of introducing a living treasure, B.D. Kanahele Dawson, who graciously shared her views on expanding access to justice through Ho'oponopono. Today, we turn our exploration more specifically toward the intersection of Western law and Native Hawaiian cultural practices to better understand the potential of integrating cultural conflict resolution practices into the practice of law and into our Western judicial system. On behalf of the judiciary, I want to extend our appreciation to everyone who's made this event possible. All of the co-sponsors, our Center for Alternative Dispute Resolution, uh, headed by Cecilia Chang and Anne-Marie Smoke. They do a wonderful job. I'm so grateful to them for their hard work. And our distinguished panelists and moderator, thank you so much for being here today. And I'd like to welcome our many distinguished guests, including cultural practitioners in Kumu, uh, Lynette Paglinawan, who's here today in the front row, Auntie Lynette, Rosalind McCullough, and Wade Lee. 
And I also would like to welcome several members of our legislature, including House Speaker Scott Psyche and uh, Representative Matt Lopresti, and acknowledge the Office of Hawaiian Affairs CEO, Dr. Kamana O. Crab, who's leading a task force on incorporating principles of Ho'oponopono into our public safety system. We have many attorneys here today, including a number who've traveled from the neighbor islands, and I'd like to extend my deepest thanks to all of them who've helped us address the immense community need to increase access to our civil justice system. And I'd like to acknowledge our guests from Columbia Law School. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor Watts, for being here today. We have four students, and we're very grateful that they made the trip here to Hawaii to share their knowledge with us and also uh, to learn with us and be part of this dialogue with us. I wanna thank you all for being here today. We have people from many different backgrounds and diverse views that will contribute to the discussion. And it's my hope that today's panel discussion will start a broader community conversation on where do we go from here? How can we bring indigenous conflict resolution practices like native peacemaking and Ho'oponopono into the practice of law? How can indigenous conflict resolution practices help resolve problems by providing another alternative to litigation? How can the judicial system adapt to accommodate indigenous conflict resolution practices? Through thoughtful de debate and open community dialogue, practical solutions will emerge and systemic improve improvement will follow, expanding access to justice for all. So once again, thank you all for being here today to participate in this important conversation. Good afternoon and aloha. Thank you, CJ Rechtenwald. I now have the privilege of calling Lori Tochiki, who will share some of her thoughts and guide today's panel discussion. I'm gonna to try to sit here with this ear thingy, but I, if, if it doesn't work, then I'll, I'll stand up. So thank you so much. This is such an important conversation and I'm, I'm so pleased that the judiciary and Cecilia Justice Rechtenwald that you've uh, opened up this space for what, what is a, such a timely and important place for us. So the intersection between the legal process and traditional process, maybe we're not talking just about, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Is this thing, okay. So it isn't just a question of which problems go where, but maybe it's also the question of how can the goals of justice and healing be best served at that intersection between the law and the cultural practices. And that's what we're gonna to examine today. So restorative practices, therapeutic jurisprudence, however you wanna dis discuss it or, or name it, we're talking about places where consensus and um, collaboration is more important than a single decision. We're talking about reconciliation and healing. We're talking about purpose maybe not so much to blame or find fault, but to find out why and the wider reason for the wrong. We're looking at concerns where there's a breach of the law, but more concern for the restoration of community and relationships. So these are all really, really important places where the law and the cultural practices look at these situations and approach them maybe a little bit differently. So how do we work them together? So in this um, process, we are looking at some of the ethical and procedural places where um, the two systems come together. So for instance, in our rules um, or guidelines about civility, about how we approach our work, we talk about the importance of seeking alternative methods of resolution. We look, we look at Rule 11, which says it's our duty as attorneys to find ways to, 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 to find that healing, to find that, some of that restoration, um, to find settlement outside of the judicial process. It's our responsibility. And also, when we look at the guidelines for Hawaii mediation, although um, Ho'oponopono, for instance, is specifically excluded from the guidelines about mediation, nevertheless, some of those same issues about confidentiality, about self-determination, 
are at play here and that's what we're going to discuss a little bit today so how is it that we can nurture that space of respect and effectiveness for the cultural practices within our legal system how do we how do we find that way to to open up that space so this discussion isn't going to be what is ho'oponopono or kind of a 101 this is more about how do we look forward and find ways to to look at that intersection and and really make a difference in that in that healing for um, those matters that come to court or that that are within our community so I'm going to ask each panelist to start by sharing a little bit about their path in this work, about their journey um, and how they define kind of the essence of the cultural practices that we're going to be looking at today. So actually, can I start with, with you, Lalani? Okay. Aloha. My name is Laulani Teal, and um, I'm here. One thing I want to start out with is a correction because on your program it says Haku Ho'oponopono. Um, however, I want to be really clear that while I do have a lot of practical, um, hands on experience in um, processes involving Ho'oponopono and, and with um, other cultural practices of conflict resolution, you know, and have done a lot of that work. My primary um, training is in La'au Lapa'au, which is uh, Hawaiian herbal medicine under Papa Henry Awai, and who also taught his form of Ho'oponopono. And under that teaching, you're not a haku until you're a kupuna of a very specific stature. So I want to be very clear about that. Um, that uh, oh, you know, with, with with much respect and aloha, that um, I am not a haku as of yet. I've still got a few uh, many gray hairs to go before that. <laughs> so mahalo. Um, I am uh, my background in this kind of process is in making pono. It is in, um, it's in working with those things that make right. You know, I've worked with many families. For um, quite a while, I ran the NHBA, NHLC peacemaking project, which worked a lot with families in very severe land disputes and other cultural matters that we encounter a lot. Um, you know, I have a background working with with uh, Ohana in um, cases involving child welfare and a lot of other um, very difficult situations. I'm also an activist. I'm a frontline activist and you know, I work a lot with people who do that kind of work, which I do want to say is a very important part of healing process because we have problems in front of us that are much bigger than can be solved through um, any kind of resolution. So, um, you know, I do those things. And, I, and I'm also a musician. I play music with a, um, a long-time healing, music healing practitioner, Liko Martin, who a lot of folks know as, um, you know, someone who brings that healing through music. So um, in that, and, and now I run the Ho'opai Pono Peace Project. And so we continue to work with families, we work with Ho'oponopono, we work and you know, and the concepts that are involved there. We work with many cultural practices. We um, do whatever it takes to bring things together. We work with community issues and um, many pretty serious situations. So I guess that's about it, mahalo. Thank you, Sean. So thanks to everyone for having us here. Let me just apologize 
I'm totally distracted by how good this thing smells. <laughs> so my, my head's not all, like, oh, this is amazing. I don't, I don't know why you don't just wear these all the time everywhere. This is awesome. Uh, anyway, uh, so I, I mean, I think I came to this <clears throat> before I knew I was even on my way coming to this, which is starting out as a kind of angry and violent young man and not having a understanding of why that was the case, but using that as a way to sort of be, as you said, an advocate for both my own people. So I grew up in the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and, and an advocate for the uh, black community there as well. And that anger f was something that was useful in that context, but it's never something that settled well or felt good to me on the inside. And I was lucky enough to, even though I came from a place where there's not a lot of opportunities, to have a few people who saw things in me and, and provided... Um, outlets for me and then doing my best to honor the their what honored the risk that they took by trying to live up to that and constantly trying to see in me what they saw and not being able to do that uh, and finally making my way through college where I was doing tutoring programs for native students where I was in New Mexico I went to college in Santa Fe New Mexico to law school where I saw a real gap in what especially Columbia Law School has to offer in terms of their focus on ways to support Native students, to be, to <coughs> have a hand in being an advocate for Native issues. And so through that, developed a project uh, to develop a curriculum to cr craft a way for the ABA to accredit a class that would be teachable in American law schools. And, and my professor, I was lucky again, like I, get, I keep getting lucky for people seeing things in me that I don't see and she really liked it and said, why don't we try to turn this into um, something and see if we, this will work. So we piloted it my last semester in law school and it, that was very successful. And so she was like, hey, you're gonna be working in a big firm in New York anyway. Why don't we just turn this into a class that you can teach while you're in private practice? And so we did that. And that went really well, and then eventually I got, again, lucky again. I, my whole life is really luck. I don't know what to say. Um, and, and to be able to come back and teach at the law school. So now I've been teaching mediation and peacemaking, and teaching peacemaking at other law schools as well, and sharing my curriculum with other law professors in the Native community who think it's important to be able to bring a Native perspective on legal issues, a Native perspective on how to use traditional knowledge and traditional wisdom to help come to a better sense of what it means to be in a place where the law affects you. And so, you know, as, as, as you all probably know, Native Hawaiians, Native Americans are at a weird intersection of, of their own customs and traditions and laws and the application of federal and in some lesser ex extent state laws applying there. And sort of trying to put all that together and I've been fortunate to have tribes want to reach out in a capacity building effort and so that's what I've been doing for the last five or six years is really helping tribes undergo capacity building measures, court consultations to try to incorporate native practices, more traditional practices into the court system and also develop systems that run parallel to the sort of Western style court system that most tribes have to give better access to not just justice, but access to healing for their own community members to try to bring us to a place where we were before everything got messed up. Thank you. Hey, Clem. So um, I've been practicing law uh, in the state of Hawaii since 1974. Um, my father has a law degree. My uncle practiced law. Their father practiced law since the early 1900s. And uh, his uncle, who was his mentor, was a judge um, on the Second Circuit Court bench. So I think that makes me fourth generation. And uh, when I started practicing, I was with a regular firm and they didn't know what to do with a woman. I was the only woman. And uh, I remember the judges would say to me, next time, tell your boss, send one of the lawyers, because he thought I was the secretary who had come to calendar call. It was right downstairs over here. So um, I had as my mentor uh, Patrick Yim, because they, the firm would said, you go and you uh, get whatever court appointed stuff and that was a whole v 
perspective that I was not anticipating in law school. And um, the family court was right here on the back of this building. And uh, from there on, I think it was, um, in, it was my um, uh, dealing uh, with the enormous suffering that was um, taking place uh, around me and in front of me and before me and after me. And so when I look at my path and why I would be so interested in this subject, I think it also is because of my experience of suffering. And um, in that regard, I, I would say that finally in 1993, I came across this great book uh, it's the Mediation Qual Quarterly Native American Perspectives on Peacemaking. And I, it just sort of resonated that, hey, you know, we can have a better place for trying out these ways that we've always operated in a, as a family. I mean, we had a way to move, get up every day and survive. Uh, you don't come down that many generations without survival. And so um, I still have the book. And um, I realized then, and I went on a path of finding out and meeting these people, you know, the Navajo peacemakers. Um, I was just enamored with Nanai Kekumu and Richard Pug Linawan, Auntie Lynette's late husband was one of the committee members on this and so we had the resources and it was just a matter of trying to harness those resources and move forward in our boat to get to the 22nd hundreds um so the 21st century is already underway and um I believe that the term peacemaking is very good um, in this world that we live in. And the notion of Pono, of being in balance, is something that we aspire to and we need to cultivate. It should be the foundation, our Pai Pai, of the building of our community and everyone in this community. and. I think it's significant that it's in this building because of the who built the building, our leaders and Ali'i, and this is the cornerstone of everything that we aspire to as a people, and what better place to talk about it. I feel like the cornerstone is, I don't know what corner it's on, but I've always felt it was on in that corner. Um, so... Uh, I thank you for being interested in this. I, um, I'm still practicing law and I'm older than all the judges at this point, and so um, who have to bow out at 70. And um, the issue keeps on coming up. You know, how do we get to this point of a resolution, of a balance? What can you do? You know, and it, it's. There's no, there's no point to, to fighting to fight. I mean, there's a point to advocate and to push, push that rock, that big stone that needs to be lifted and moved. But there's no point to fight to fight. And there's every reason for us as, as lawyers not to settle, but to reach some sort of resolution. I am not a haku. I, do, I don't practice mediation. I've been a consumer of mediations for my clients, a consumer of ho'oponopono, a consumer of arbitration, countless bench trials. And um, this is a tool that we should be familiar with 
and using, and I say this for all of us because it's not going to hurt anybody, to have a spiritual component in your interaction with one another. So we'll just leave it at that, that we can be, you know, thinking about and in the presence of much more than what we would ever have, you know, thought. Thank you. Thank you. Malia. Oh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, so my first uh, foray into this arena, I would have to say, started from what I would say small kid time where um, being from Molokai, born and raised, uh, you know, our island is kind of known as this just say no island when it comes to de developers coming in and trying to, to bring grandiose plans of uh, creating another kind of Waikiki. And I come from, you know, just a, a background where those who surrounded me, including Uncle Wade Lee, who's here in the audience, was just these staunch defenders and protectors of the Aina. And so I was raised in the Aloha Aina movement. And initially it was, we need lawyers. Um, we need young Hawaiian lawyers to defend the Aina and to help us. Because there's, you know, only so much huli huli chicken sales and fun benefit concerts you can put up to pay for legal fees. So that was my initial um, foray into going to law school and, and becoming a litigator initially. Um, but I, I began to realize that not everyone has an equal f footing or in terms of access to the legal system. And if, even if you are fortunate to access the legal system, it's not without great personal sacrifice. Um, so I, I got involved a lot in Iwi Kupuna issues, native ancestral burials. And I, I was litigating a case in South Kona on the Big Island. And I watched my client who was, an, who was a cultural descendant of several um, burials that had been destroyed by this um, multi-million dollar kind of resort uh, development uh, in South Kona. I watched him be being blackballed in his community. I watched his wife leave him and his his whole family fall apart. And he was just trying to do the right thing, the Pono thing, by his ancestors that had been reduced into tiny fragments, pieces of shrapnel um, that the dozer had taken out in order to put in a golf course. And, I'm, and I looked at this situation and I'm like, you know, it's like Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall and you're trying to put the pieces together, but you will never make Humpty Dumpty whole again. And I could see that if I continued down this path as a litigator, um, on Native Hawaiian rights issues, you know, dealing with development that is already occurring and, and burials being destroyed, that I would just become a glorified um, damage control specialist. And I said, you know, as an attorney, you learn, you learn different tools, and I can apply these tools that I've learned to get more at the front end. And so I got... I. I served on a number of boards and commissions at the state and county level. Um, I was the borough council chair for Molokai Island Borough Council. I was the chair of the Molokai Planning Commission. I served on the state environmental council. Um, and my whole thing was how can I change institutions to understand the Kanaka Maoli worldview so that we can reach mutually beneficial results. And then I was exposed to Ho'oponopono through Uncle Wade Lee and my kane who served under Uncle Wade as a um, haku Ho'oponopono and wellness counselor. And I, I remember I would drop off my kane to work 
and I'd see angry kids throwing chairs in the beginning of the 21 days. And then at the end of the 21 days, um, working with, with Uncle Wade and the Haku Ho'oponopono counselors, I saw families embracing, and I would often see um, parents coming to my kane and saying, thank you so much, my, my child is a different person. You know, we're whole again. And for me, I was like, I want, I want to understand that, you know. And so, through osmosis, I've, I've, un, I've gotten to learn some of the principles of Ho'oponopono. And one of the things that um, my kane says that Uncle Wei taught him is you have to work on Ho'opono first. Each side has to Ho'opono themselves. They have to do kind of like a self-inventory. And then, and then when they're able to, to see their own, their own fault in this, then they're able to come and meet. And so I, I took that understanding um, deep within me, and I also saw the impact of Ho'oponopono um, in my own personal life because there were certain things happening in my ohana that my, my kane assisted me with. And I remember it just in five minutes, he kind of, he broke me down into just convulsive tears and, and sobs. And I felt literally like a tree root was in my heart and it got totally yanked out and a place that was cold and, and just stagnant began to fill up with blood and warmth and I could feel again. And I, and I knew how powerful it was. And so um, I, I take those principles and I try to apply it to the work that I do. Now as a professor of law and Hawaiian studies, I teach Native Hawaiian rights clinic. And we've, we've done a lot of work with different federal and state agencies uh, where there is tension between Native Hawaiian community and these agencies with respect to communities wanting to malama or care for their resources and government entities not feeling quite comfortable about it or a bit resistant. We've tried to work through some of those tensions and I have to say we've gotten a, a lot of positive results. Thank you, thank you. As I listen to these paths, I think some of the themes that really come up are about trying to seek out a way to, to, to ease that pain and the suffering and the anger and, and within the tool chest of the law, not always finding a tool that will help to ease that. So really a searching for a way to find that healing and balance. Um, and often when we talk about this and some of the themes that we heard, we're about family in Ohana, right? We often think about how important as the family is the foundation of of, of our of society that healing within the family is so important. But I'm also hearing the importance of that healing within communities and with other issues. So I'm going to now ask more specifically about kind of the legal kuleana. So when you look at, you know, this intersection between the law and traditional practice, let's first look just for a few minutes on, okay, the, in terms of Native Hawaiian and Native American legal issues, what is that responsibility of the law? What are the things that um, the law is trying to protect? What is that, what is that kuleana? So I'm gonna ask Malia and, and Sean to just address that. You know, it, it, help us think about that part and then we'll move into, okay, so where does it fall short? So then that'll be the next question after this. So Malia, you wanna address so, that? Um, it, so my, my background is mainly Native Hawaiian rights law, so I'm going to just speak from that um, level. So, you know, Native, Native Hawaiians have unique rights um, in Hawaii that you don't see in other parts of the United States. Um, and they, these are Hawaiian kingdom laws that, um, that have been adopted and, and persist today in state law. Uh, whether it's statutes and constitutional constitutional law, and it has to do with 
a lot of like access and gathering rights and um, religious practices. Um, what I what I find is that there are the way in which the courts have interpreted these laws for the for the most part has been very positive and what has come out of that is um, I would say like the Kapa'akai standard where where it's important when uh, in terms of looking at how a potential project might affect uh, Native Hawaiian rights there's a there's a kind of a three-step process where there's an inventory of certain what what resources are available and what practices are taking place in a certain area and then looking at at what could be the potential impact of a project on those uh, resources and practices and then looking at ways to mitigate harm um, so I, I would say there are, there are mechanisms within the law that allow for um, healing or at least protection of Hawaiian rights. Um, sometimes, you know, without going too much into the second, the, the second part of the question, um, there's sometimes the way that, that agencies <coughs> interpret these laws or implement these laws, that's where we fall short. Um, yeah. That's pretty cool. Thank you. So, Sean, this is this is your academic world. So That's right. Sh share with us a little bit about. Well, to be totally honest, it's hard to know what the laws are meant to protect, and so when I talk about laws, I mean the, both the federal laws and then the laws that tribes in themselves enact. I'll leave states out of it for the moment. Um, and the reason it's hard to know is because there have been so many different postures that the federal government has taken with regards to the indigenous people in this country that have, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a wonder we don't all have actual whiplash from just trying to get our heads around how the federal government has a disposition toward us. So, you know, you go from the termination period where they're trying to completely eliminate us as, as, as having any sort of relationship with the federal government to you know allotment period where they they decide that all of a sudden we need to be uh, you know have be a part of the 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 country but using a different set of of values it, it so it's hard to know so the i would say the only thing we know for sure and this is established in the late 1800s and and early supreme court jurisprudence which is that the federal government does have a trust responsibility for the indigenous people in this country now, what a trust responsibility means, uh, no one knows, and so there's tons and tons of litigation around that, and it's constantly changing, and you know, it, it's sort of sad because I would say at least eight, maybe the nine least knowledgeable people about Native people in this country, Indian people in this country, Hawaiian people in this country are sitting on the Supreme Court. So, and those are the people making the decisions when all this litigation comes down. So it, it's hard to know what it's meant to protect. I, I do know that there are certain statutes that have been enacted. So, you know, you have statutes enacted to protect grave sites, or statutes enacted to protect um, sacred sites that aren't necessarily grave sites, but, you know, are sacred for other reasons. Uh, statutes enacted to protect different resource rights that tribes may have. Um, it's 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 really difficult to know what it's there to do, and that I do think that's part of why this movement that's starting uh, that has been going for I guess since the the eighties really, for tribes to and, and Native Hawaiians too to reclaim their own traditional wisdom and knowledge and use that as a force for good and a force for uh, reclamation and restoration and change is important because. It's clear to me that the federal government doesn't know why they're doing what they're doing. And, and in some cases, I do think they're trying their best. I, I think the intent is there. And part part of the reason we've, we've gotten in such a big mess as we have is because the intent to do... What, what's that saying? That the road to hell is paved with good intentions? Right? The intent to do good has gotten us in a lot more trouble than in some cases the, in, than the intent to do harm has. And so since we don't have a sense and they don't have a sense of what their intent is it might as well come from us it might as well come from the people who have the traditional wisdom though we might have to go looking hard to find it again that have customs that we know have been useful and helpful to us and help us become a culture of people who can unite though again we might have to go hard we might have to look hard to find where those are 
but it might as well be us who brings this back. It might as well be us who makes the determination for what it will be, how the laws will affect us, what they're meant to protect. It might as well be us to, to be the people to sort of change where we've been and where we're going. So Euclid and Lelani, can I ask you to respond to that a little bit in terms of, you know, adding to that and then also where are the where are the pukas? What what you know, and, and both of both Malia and Shadner started on that, but maybe you can add to it. Well, I thought your um, your question about why, uh, you know, why do they have these rules if they're not going to enforce them? Or what's the reason, you know, we have a National Historic Preservation Act, but do they even have meaningful consultations? You know, I mean, there's here, um, Malia talked about the Kapa'akai uh, analysis that each agency is going to undertake to see if it adversely affects known cultural practices for land and um and yet it just becomes in its actual unfolding uh a cut and paste job of developers and what they present to the table and um and here you have this possibility of having a bona fide consultation and there's no tools you know so you have these planners um, some who have no training in planning but they're working for the planning company that's doing the environmental impact statement and your cultural assessment is part of that statement and we're all going wow you know and it, can, and it can perpetuate itself for decades. And uh, I, I have to say that's where I find um, things, you know, don't connect because you have the, the road of good intentions and then you have what can be seen as the sabotage of those good intentions. And the question becomes, how do we um how do we get get some uh, traction here you know uh, and so I there's a part of me that um, wants to get to a kind of process you know in the consultation process of what the federal government requires in the Kapa'akai analysis. Is it going to have to be the contested case hearing? That's the analysis. That's cynical, you know? Uh, that's like saying, yeah, let's get, let's get in the, the ring. And on round three, whoever's standing up, that's the analysis. It cannot be that way. And so um, I think we as a people um, who come from this land and live with the, our community here we live here uh, in the on these islands and these all these everyone is a member of this community and stands on this ground and to the extent that you stand on this ground that is where I think we've got to build um, and the Aloha Aina I'm still trying to comprehend it the way that our ancestors understood it because I think there's a meaning there that we can, you know, we ha we're still in search for what's going to be that, f that force that comes from, our, from the ground up and makes and, and pulls us together in a functional way and so I'm still, you know, pondering what types of, because we've tried it all. Mediations, arbitrations, contested case hearings, ho'oponopono, they can go on for decades. I mean, seriously, it's, and maybe it's all part of peeling the onion. And that's what we're all engaged in, is getting to some point 
of, you know, of getting to the core. But we all have to survive to be standing around to do that. Maha. Can you help us with this a little bit more? And especially, Lalani, in terms of, you know, how? How, mm -hmm. how do indigenous process? I mean, you know, like, the, what you've been saying, we, we're trying all these things. We're seeking so, so much, you know, to, to alleviate this, the, the, the pain and the, the discord and to find that balance. So how? How does this work? So one thing that I'd like to um, start with in terms of the concept involved, you know, when, when we're dealing with law in whatever capacity, you know, law in and of itself deals with positions. Rights are positions. You know, um, uh, it, when you work with law in any capacity, you're dealing with the position of one party pretty much versus the position of another party. You know, and um, that party may be the state, it may be who, whoever is involved and in whatever context that law exists, you know, so, so you have those positions. Now mediation goes deeper than those positions and gets to the interests. And that's where the onus in mediation, in, in regular mediation, you're looking at the interests of the parties. Ho'oponopono and cultural processes deal with pono. That is where the onus is, is achieving pono. And it takes that pono, which is within each of us, every single one of us already, and that needs to grow into the pono of the relationship. So, you know, going from positions to interests to that place of pono is, um, takes very different kinds of approaches to, to manifest these things. So that is, um, that, that's a fundamental thing that needs to be understood before any practical application can go forward in these things. Um, I will also say that we live right now in an extremely exciting and um, amazing time in human consciousness that is also extremely difficult and challenging. And this is throughout humanity. So, um, and the way that that is manifesting you know, if we look at the world, right, there we're coming from a presumption that it was okay to resolve things by people killing other people. Honestly, that's, that's where we're coming from. And, you know, in a sense, that has sort of evolved into the um, legal system that we work with now a lot, um, you know, where you resolve those things in a way where that adversity is placed into a more civil fashion. And now, in terms of human consciousness, you know, not just for Kanaka, but for everyone, we're looking at getting to places where we can actually resolve. And how we get to those places is to look at those practices that have been with us in our cultures all along. You know, because while those things were happening, what was really happening as well in the homes, in, in the communities, you know, between the fishermen and the farmers, 
there's a great deal of skilled resolution, you know, that comes from the knowledge that kupuna carry, you know, that, that the elders are able to manifest. And, um, you know, that is a very, very important thing in terms of how we're going to go forward and apply this, how we're applying it on every level is a return to that sense of pono. And it's not easy. It's very, very difficult. You know, ho'oponopono, one thing that, um, you know, I encountered that definitely we've always talked about the challenge with court, with interfacing between Ho'oponopono and court, one of the many challenges, you know, there's the challenge that it is a family process, really, where you have to cultivate aloha, you know, there has to be aloha, that you're restoring that flow of aloha, you know, so that's a huge challenge. There's also the challenge that um, of time, Ho'oponopono is not a short thing. It can happen in five minutes, as Mal Malia says, there can be like this huge, awesome, um, you know, thing that just happens, but that's between us and Akua. It doesn't, you know, we can't make that miracle just manifest. It takes the time that that healing takes, like any other healing. So that is a really, really important thing to understand. Not to say that it can't be done, it can totally be done. And, you know, we've seen it done. It needs to be done in such a way that respect those things that will, in fact, actually achieve pono, you know? And it's also, in Ho'oponopono, we're dealing with the oya i'o truth. And for those who don't know, oya i'o, it is the deepest level of truth that you're talking about. It's not just what is correct. It's not even just what is factually right. You know, you're dealing with the truth that is deep inside that you know in your heart and soul is true, you know, and, and it's not blocked out by being hid, hidden by any other thing. It's, it's very, very important. Um, one thing I'm going to have to say, and this is a little bit, you know, partly from, from the Ho'oponopono world, but, you know, more so from the world of activism, too, and, and just working with Hawaiian communities, is that when you're dealing with the court system specifically, there's always an elephant in the room, and that ele elephant in the room is that the court system can only achieve a certain level of pono. It cannot go beyond that because the court system itself fundamentally is based upon a system that is, in the eyes of very many people, not legal. You know, to begin with, it's based on an illegal invasion of Iolani Palace in 1893, which resulted in um, what we have today, you know, through all of the things that happened. And, you know, the, there's a whole question of, you know, is that legitimate or is that not legitimate? So if the authority comes from that place, you know, it's very difficult to achieve pono. Because of that, it's always going to be the ele elephant in the room. However, when, you know, many people here talked about intentions, those intentions are very important when those intentions are truly pono, you know, when that is, and when they're connected to the oya i'o truth, because each of us can only do what we can do with what we have. And if what we have is the current um, resources that are in front of us, whether it's a contested case, you know, or whether it's a, an Ohana conference or whatever we may have, whether it's the legislature, you know, it, we need to do the very best that we can do and to achieve Pono within that, with that whole truth coming being able 
to fully come out in that. And that is where the healing will take place and it can take place. So I'm gonna go from that elephant in the room a little bit and ask a question that's come from, from, from all of us. And, and it goes to that intersection. So here you are, here's the reality. We've got the legal system, so what do you do? So how do we make that space? What do you do when the case has already been filed? We're trying to restore aloha and there isn't, you know, there, there isn't a relationship there in the first place. What, how might we address that place, that intersection place? How might we make a space for this kind of pono um, or process within the judiciary? So it's a little bit, a little bit off from where we were headed, but I think it's also getting at that that space that we want to. And and I'm gonna just, whoever wants to jump in and then hopefully everybody can jump in a little bit with that one. I guess for me, it's um, <clears throat> like I said, you know, getting kind of in front of it before it be, becomes a point of total conflict and, and hardening of positions and, you know, it's showtime now. Um, so the only way I can really do it is just provide an example um, so my Native Hawaiian Rights Clinic, we were helping the Kahana community. Um, they wanted to restore their hukilau traditions and malama, you know, their area as they had done traditionally. But there were jet skis coming in there and breaking up the akule pile. And there was a lot of, um, just neglect of the area and so many multiple users that the that the traditions of that place were just being buried by that. And so, you know, our clinic helped the community to look at um, different uh, possible scenarios on how they could best um, protect their resources, whether it's through certain kind of marine protection designations. but. We had recommended maybe doing a community-based subsistence fishing area, but the community wasn't quite ready for that. So we did this sort of hybrid thing called Kahana Kilokai, and it's sort of like this Makai Watch thing where, where the community, um, through small steps, gains you know kuleana for their resources and works with the state. But some tensions began to arise from that situation because there were certain, you know, enforcement officers um, that didn't get the memo that this was a program. And so there was a feeling of, of like a little bit turf war kind of, there was some resistance. Um, and, and so it got a little bit messy in the community, you know, just as there was rebuilding their pride and capacity, um, you know, and, and they've been typically looked at as at the by the state as just you know kind of like this good for nothing welfare kind area they don't know how to take care of their place and and you know they were they were doing these cultural hours in order to to kind of it was more like a tourist kind of vision for kahana as a living ahupua'a but the families were very um I don't know, they felt demoralized by that. So doing this Kahana Kilokai thing was bringing back that community pride. And then and then these tensions arose. And so the whole program was threatened. And and so, you know, I had this conversation with the community. You know, they're like, we wanna we wanna sue the state, you know, screw them. And and then I said, Okay, I come from Moloka Inuya Hina. Molokai, great child of Hina. And on Molokai, we, we kue, but we also have Hina power. It's this kind of very, it's, a, it's like they call it soft power, but it's actually very powerful. It's like either you're going to ram the door down or you're going to just, um, or it's like a stone that and your water and you just slowly erode it down to a pebble and you just go around it or you just smooth it over until it, until you and that stone kind of becomes one. So I told them the story of how 
um, my great grandfather, he was he was a commercial fisherman, and there was one family that stole his net. I mean, stole the fish from his nets, and it was kind of like again turfy turf war kind in the fishery. And my grandfather had twelve children, and I think like six of them were sons, including my grand my grandfather. And so my great grandfather, um, they put. Basically, they pulled up the nets, they put the rest of the fish in a cooler that wasn't stolen, and they went to that person's house, and my grandfather thought, oh, we're going to fight, you know? My grandfather was a teenager at the time. But my great-grandfather said, bring the cooler. And and so my my grandfather was confused, but he brought the cooler. And, and so my great-grandfather talked to the old man of that house and said, you know, both of us have big families and God has blessed my ohana and we have plenty to eat. And so I just wanted to share the blessing with you folks. And so my great-grandfather gave that family all the fish, you know, the stolen fish plus what was left. And so my, my grandfather telling me this story um, said that it was like transformative, you know. And so I kind of told the kahana community that. And he said, maybe we got to... We got to look at this, the bigger picture, that this, is, this program has brought community pride and it's, and it's worth saving. And so maybe it's about us humbling ourselves and seeing how we can do better. And then if you guys want to do that, then I'm, my students and I will make the commitment to, to work with, with the state to kind of ease these tensions. And so we planned, they, they made food, we went to Kahana, you know, my student who was also from Kahana, she she was very angry inside and she said, well, let's just go to the state and go meet them at their office. And I go, no, 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 no. The land is the is a witness. The aina is a witness. And I think that's one of the things too in our court system. We, Hawaiians fight for the aina, but it's hard to bring the aina into the courtroom. Mm -hmm. and they have the, And it's hard to... There's so many voices that we have to speak for that cannot speak for themselves. And the aina is, is a person. It's not, it's not a commodity. It's not, it's not an inanimate thing. It's ohana. So I said, no, kahana, we have to bring, bring the, the state to kahana, and the land has to be a witness. And so um, basically, without going into too much details, we, we reach a point of agreement and there was a an acknowledgement that both sides could do better. And then I had this wonderful student from Fiji um, and he come from a traditional system with a, a chiefly system with their fisheries. And so he saw my energy waning and so he said, um, so let's kind of all stand in line and let me see if I heard um, what we agreed to and if we did, um, if you agree, then just take one step towards each other. And and we had like five different things that we had agreed to. And everybody took steps towards each other. And at the end, we all embraced. Mm. And and then I had another law student who, who makes Ava. So I said, well, let's seal this with Ava, that we make this commitment to each other. So we had male eye, we had food, and we had Ava. And... And then we was all happy with each other. And I, and I actually saw grown men crying. And, and I, I, f I felt open hearts. And then after that, we heal by when jump in the water. And, and I saw like all the worry lines disappear and everybody were joyful. And the program is still running strong. So I can see, you know, utilizing some of the principles of Ho'oponopono. We were able to look at those tensions and then uh, disentangle that hihia, you know, the entanglement. And and what I did was I kind of, I made like a tea leaf layer and I would tie it in knots. And I said, our objective is to untie each knot in this lay. And, and we, we got to be honest with each other, you know, and honest with ourselves, you know, and... and and so it was um, very beautiful, and we had, you know, the state, um, the head of the, the do care office, 
he talked about his childhood growing up, you know, and what he was taught by his father and his kupuna about how you take care of the resources. And that that was why he, he was joined the state, you know, to care for the resources. So we understood that that the common ground was we all wanted to malama, we all wanted to care for the resources, but we had to understand each other and see each other as human beings, eyeball to eyeball. You know, so so that was successful and you know, I'm currently working on a case where two Native Hawaiian women were were cited for violation of the Marine Mammal Protection Act when they performed the traditional burial rite of a of a whale at sea. And you know, under under the, under Noah's administrative law judge, they have to look at it as a strict liability, no mens rea kind of thing, where it doesn't matter what the intent is. But the judge found, you know, the cultural issues and the religious practices authentic and very compelling. And so the administrative law judge cited these women collectively of $500 where the fine is really um, up to 27000 each and possible one-year jail time. But because other Native Hawaiians could end up being held liable under the same act for, for doing acts of malama, they, they realize that they have to kind of be the standard bearers. So they're going to possibly go through the entire court system, you know, so... Uh, an issue that they're dealing with too is that these these whales are they call it um the kinolau, their body forms or of the ocean god Kanaloa, and they're seen as ohana, they're seen as family, and so you know they were born in a time of po in the infinite um darkness of the darkness of infinite potential, and these these Kanaloa species chanted kanaka, Hawaiians, into existence, into the ao. And when they're in, on this earthly plane, they manifest in the kino law of, of these whales and dolphins. And so Po exists in the Levalani, in the heavens, as well as in the deep blue sea. So it's important to con continue that cycle and return these kanaloa to Po. So these Hawaiian women, they were actually trying to work cooperatively with NOAA, and they were part of the Marine Mammal Response Team. But what essentially happened was then they were kind of criminalized for, for performing that burial right. And so there's issues also, continuing issues of how does NOAA work with Native Hawaiian communities in Marine Mammal Response Strandings? And then what happens to their remains if they perform a necropsy? Does it remain indefinitely with the agency? Or because under NAGPRA, under the Native Americans Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, they could actually be seen as sacred objects. Or they could even be seen as, as you know, if, if we're looking at our genealogical connection, they could just be seen as Evie, as ancestral bones. So... Actually, tomorrow I'll be meeting with Noah and we're going to be hammering out what those procedures should be. And it's about kind of this meeting of the minds and hearts and saying, look, we understand your position. We ask that you understand ours. You know, we don't have to be in conflict. So those are the kind of two areas that I'm working on pre um, more currently, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Those are wonderful examples of our role as attorneys, but also as leaders and counselors to shape that kind of dialogue, to shape and teach. And, and then I love the preventative idea of how do you help people, which just is so in line with like rule 11, right? That says we have to seek this. We have to seek that kind of resolution as a part of our job. It's not, it's not a, a shirking of that job. It's a part of our job. What, any other thoughts of stories about ways where in this intersection, we can make this work? Can I just say that one of the things that people often need, they, they need encouragement, they need time, and they need help. 
you know, I think probably everyone here is um, has a lot of hands-on experience with the level of demand that is out there in the community, you know, that there's such a huge, huge need for assistance and that the resources are so stretched thin that it, it's very, very difficult, you know, and when you're talking about making um, good solutions, you know, and this is, one thing that I will say from working with Kanaka families, um, you know, through the peacemaking project that that we did, we you know we started it out as a um, specifically a Ho'oponopono project, you know, giving Auntie Lynette a hard time, <laughs> you know, about to to bring these cases to Ho'oponopono, and a lot of the time, I would say. 90 something percent of the time what we found was that before we could even go there there were situations that needed to be addressed right away cooperatively addressed within the ohana and cultural skills were needed for that but it a lot of times they're very serious to do items you know um, preventing a tax sale of land where the, the taxes hadn't been paid. Because, you know, when you have Koleana lands, you have a lot of times 100, 200 heirs that all technically are owners of the place. Some of them have often been approached by developers or other interests and have sold their pieces or whatever you know you have these very complicated situations and you have immediate things that need to be addressed and the only way that those things can be addressed is cooperatively but it's not ho'oponopono that it will take not the full on you know because ho'oponopono itself is a really serious process so a lot of times it takes um, you know, other just hands-on work, working with the ohana to be able to bring them to that. In order to do that, there needs to be a lot of support. You know, there's legal resources are needed. You know, we build trusts, we build, um, uh, you know, agreements <coughs> between people that will allow them to have the stability to be able to carry on together. You know, and that's cooperative work. It's, yeah, it does involve the legal system, but it also involves the, the content, the flow of their aloha, you know, and restoring that flow and bringing people together and allowing them to um, have a good solid basis upon which they can naturally interact as ohana in the first place. So, you know, those resources, having um, attorneys, having people to help situations, you know, you have a lot of situations that are so difficult, people just don't even know where to start. You know, right now I'm working with people in Wailua, in Wailua Nui in on Kauai, um, amongst other places, which if anybody's been following that situation, oh my goodness, it's it's a huge difficulty and there are no legal resources to help people. You know, and when you end up in that situation without help, then people have to do what they can do. Sometimes it's adversarial. Sometimes it's... um what people think of as, oh, crazy sovereign stuff, you know, it could be a lot of different things, but those are the things that happen when there's not enough kokua, you know? So that is one thing that I would say just, just on every level, you know, whether it's advocating, you know, like M Malia talked about, um, you know, helping people, cultural practitioners who really it should be obvious that they're doing this awesome work and yet they're being persecuted, you know, and, and 
that's one of so many situations like that. And, you know, luckily, you know, those Wahine who I know well had, had um, you know, had Malia to help them. But there are so many who are also there and probably also asking for help, you know, and there's so few resources to be able to make that happen, you know, and in the world of cultural resolution, there are very few resources. And that is the real difficulty that honestly, there are a lot more resources being used against these practices than to support them. And that's the truth. So, you know, turning that around is where we need to see those doors open up. And I would guess that that's probably true, not only here, that's probably a, um, a worldwide situation. Sean, do you want to add to that? In the so it's what well, can I just ask was your question about what ha how do we sort of fit this in after something's been filed well, right? that that was the springboard for this uh -huh. but it's kind of a question of okay we got and, and let me just summarize a little bit about what I just heard from Laulani which is we also so we've got this intersection right between the legal system and cultural practices this yearning for the healing and the restorative practices but then we also have this need for the legal resources and having those things coordinate somehow. So you have this very intense process, this very deep process of finding that balance, but then we also have timelines, legal timelines, immediate needs. How do you make those, I mean, like, you know, just kind of practical, concrete thinking kind of question. How do these, how do those things come together? That's, that's the underneath of that question. Like for instance, you already have a lawsuit. Now what do you do? Right. right. Well, you know, so one of the interesting things is that it's not like the legal process is nimble, and it's not it's not fast. It doesn't ha it doesn't occur quickly. Uh, and you know, when you build in, when you think through the time from the inception of a legal a lawsuit until it's done, it's it's a I mean, I don't know what the average is, but it's got to be a couple of years at least, right? And so if we just said from the beginning we're going to just begin with this other process the amount of time that it takes might be roughly equal in some cases maybe even less because you're talking about transforming people and that just talks that only addresses the issue at hand it doesn't address the time savings down the line because these people have changed themselves mm -hmm. in some way they've mm -hmm. become different people by going through the process they've reconnected with culture they've reconnected with uh, family or what, whatever the case is that might prevent some sort of conflict down the line. So, you know, I think at business schools, which I've never been to, they teach this concept of like, something can be done cheap, fast, or good. And that you can only ever have two of the three. So right, if something's cheap and good, it won't be fast. If something's good and fast, it won't be cheap. That sort of thing, right? So, mm -hmm. And it seems to me that using cultural practices within the existing current legal system will be good and in many cases cheap, certainly cheaper than going through discovery and all the other, paying a bunch of lawyers, right? So it'll be good and cheap, it just won't be fast. Um, and I, to me, it was like, where's the disadvantage? Because court isn't fast anyway. It's definitely not cheap. And there's not a single study about the outcomes of the legal process or people's satisfaction going through the legal process that says that it's good, right? So if we can have two out of three using cultural practices and getting, and we're batting O for three using the regular court system anyway, why don't we just do the thing where we can have two out of three? And there are certainly ways to do that, right? There are complications that will come in for sure because, you know, in, in best case scenario, you got two litigants on either side who have familiarity, have a cultural connection, have familiarity with the processes, right? And that, then it, the, it becomes easier to use that. But another scenario is you have one who has that connection and one who doesn't. And then, you know, in a state like this, or when you're in, in a forum where you've got a large indigenous population, why not just default to using the indigenous method? Because that's the sort of prevailing, that's where the, the culture is coming from anyway, that's the prevailing population. The, the more difficult, and then you have, you know, where neither person, neither litigant's connected to the culture is connected to the process, in which case, 
you know, I mean, maybe you say, okay, we won't use it in that process. So you maybe say, you know what, we're going to use it anyway. And we're just going to remove the, the things that would be dishonorable to, to steal sort of the culture from. But some of the techniques and processes, there's no reason those can't translate. And in fact, if anyone has the time or inclination to check this out, uh, there is a guy in Washtenaw County, Michigan, which is where the University of Michigan is. His name is Judge Tim Connors. And he is doing things I would have said if you had proposed it to me before would have been impossible. He is using indigenous practices in the state court system there with non-indigenous people uh, in the exact right way, which is he asks us all the time for help. He consults with us. He does his very best to honor us. He asks us for permission to do things before he does that, before he does anything. And he's getting results that are out of sight. I mean, resolving cases using peacemaking techniques and multi like class action suits in, in airline crashes. I mean, who would have thought that would ever be possible? And he's told me how he's done it a few times. I still don't get it. Uh, it is re truly remarkable what he's doing. And what's more remarkable is the way that he's doing. He does it in a way that doesn't dishonor the practices, that doesn't dishonor the people that the practices come from. And he does it in a way where he, he's clear with us along the way about how we can be of help to him and how we can uh, help guide him to do it the best way possible. So if I guess all, all that is to say, we know it can be done when you have two people who are connected to the culture. We know it can be done where you have one person who's connected to the culture and one who isn't, especially in a place like this where even if you're not a native Hawaiian, there's something about being here that you, you sort of get, you become part of, you become familiar with the culture in a way that you could understand the process, even if it's not your own. Or, and, and now Tim is showing us it can be done with two folks who have zero connection to the process, who have zero connection to one another except that their, fam, their daughter or son happened to have bought an airline ticket at some point and flown on that particular airline. That's their sole connection to one another. And he's making these processes useful and for better outcomes for, it, for the people. So we know it can be done. So the trick is, or the question is, are we going to take the time to do it? The real question is, do you want better outcomes for your people? Whoever your people are, right? If you're talking about the people going through the state court system who may have cultural connection or not, or are you talking about if you're a tribe or a native people like the native Hawaiian where you, your people are your people, uh, do you want better outcomes for them or not? If the answer to that is no, what are we doing here in the first place? And if the answer to that is yes, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we pursuing this other method? I think we're at the point where we should start looking at some of the questions because there are quite a few. So Cecilia is going to share some questions with us. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. All right, there are several questions, and forgive me if I just rattle off maybe four at a time because they're in similar batches. <laughs> so uh, some of them are directed just to particular panelists, but I think that all of you uh, have a, some experience in this area. One is, okay, is there a Cherokee version of Ho'oponopono? Uh, with respect to Ho'oponopono and native peacemaking, how does one encourage a client to engage in that mm -hmm. if it is appropriate and if the opposing side is obnoxious and, and very combative? Uh, in the civil context, how does one reconcile that with our ethical obligations to, to be a strong advocate? How do we explain that to our insurance companies who are paying our retainers. Well, this is just a very practical, uh, basic question in the beginning. Uh, if, I, if I may, Sean, is there a Cherokee version of Ho'oponopono? Explain that to our insurance company. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, so most tribes in, on the mainland, so you know most what we would call American Indian tribes, do have some process 
there and the one of the things I think is the kind of the most interesting is that the methodologies are very similar to, and for all of them they certainly diverge in lots of ways too but there's lots of base uh, techniques that are that are very similar and, and similar to Ho'oponopono as well and the goals are almost always exactly the same which is to not to cast blame not to look backwards but to look forward and look towards healing and restoration of the community so we're restoring the community to health which is a radically different goal than we use in a court system and it even is a different goal than we use in a process that we would consider alternative to court like mediation where we're really trying to problem solve in mediation um, you know, I guess there's something like called transformative mediation, but that doesn't happen much in, uh, in the court system. The, the goals for peacemaking is to sort of get the community back, restore it back to health, so healing everyone. And that means sometimes you're looking at, you, you are using a process where you're looking at, re looking at rights the way they were before contact. So community collective rights versus individual rights. So that when you're and, and, and it gets tricky, right? Because we are now we're 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 property owners now. We didn't used to be property owners. All of us used to be a tribe, and we would own, we would have land, and that would be ours. But ours as a people. Now I have my own house, and if you come onto my onto my yard, I can make you leave. And if you don't leave, in some states, you can you know do lots of really bad things to the person who won't leave. Uh, and we also treat our children as property rights these days, right? So instead of thinking of our children as a resource that we share as a community. It is something like this, this child is mine, I have certain rights and so forth. And so those come into conflict when you are go, using these peacemaking processes for things that are sort of really dire for individuals, you know, like family, breaking up a family is it's a really personal and hurtful thing to, to be going through. And the idea of a collective, the community having a collective right when you're talking about a child is complicated because it just doesn't comport with what the law, how the law looks at a child. So all that is to say, um, there is there is a process that the Cherokee use, there's a pro and it looks very similar to the process that lots of other people use, or lots of other tribes use, and I would suspect even that if we broke it all down, it would look very similar to the process that Native Hawaiians use, and the, with differences that have to do with the very specific uh, tenets of the culture, but a lot of the mechanisms would look similar and the goals would look very similar, right? Because we're trying to restore our people to health. And then in, in follow-up to the uh, other three questions that I had posed, uh, and I think this, this dovetails with the ethical issues that you were talking about earlier. Uh, how does one reconcile the ethical obligation as an advocate versus what might be in the client's best interest in working for what is Pono? I think, you know, lawyers from opposing sides, they, they negotiate, they have been settlement negotiations and things like that. And I, I think if each attorney can query their client, if, if they want total healing, they want restorative justice, they're committed to solving the issue rather than having, um, you know, one win and the other lose, then there may, you know, then you would still be a zealous advocate for your client if both want to, to achieve a better result through Ho'oponopono. So I think there's ways to deal with that ethical, and ethics issue. Yeah. And doesn't that just circle us back to Rule 11? That at the outset and later on in litigation, counsel are to consider alternative dispute resolution practices that can benefit the client. Yeah. I think if I can add a little bit, I mean, even in our mediation practice, some of the things that are foundational are making sure that the clients understand what their rights are, understand what the options are, have that knowledge base. So it's, it's solution focused based upon the sharing and understanding of knowledge, right? And so I think that's also part of that ethical responsibility as people go into any alternative dispute resolution that process that there is that teaching of what, what, what the person's rights are. 
Um, but I want to, can I add to the next question, which is, how do you engage people? How do you engage someone in, in this process? I mean, like, with mediation or with, like, Ohana conferencing, sometimes it doesn't feel like a choice, you know, because um, courts will order mediation or courts, courts will order arbitration and that the gets them in the door. But how do we truly engage the people in, in Ho'oponopono? Can I say that um, in my practical experience working with families and communities and things like that, um, I have to say that it's not really very hard, usually, usually. There, there are definitely exceptions to that, but getting people to engage in these processes is the easy part. Um, generally speaking, and you know, this is a major generalization. People are looking for solutions. Everyone is looking for solutions, you know, on all sides of problems. And if they have some means that's offered to achieve that solution, my experience has been that people will tend to take it. The, the problem is that very few have that means. You know, it's it's very rare that anything is offered, that there's any help that comes for these folks, you know. And um, sometimes people can be very, very combative at first. Yes, they're willing to engage in a process, but they're not willing to let go of their position, you know. And, and that's a normal, natural thing that... Ha comes from each person's understanding of Pono. And when you work with anything that builds Pono, it's really important to honor that. You know, from wherever they're coming from, they may be coming from vastly different places in that understanding of what is Pono. But that understanding is where people can be brought together and you know what I've found in the community is that people want that a lot and too often they just don't have the opportunity they just don't have the support and they just don't have the resources I, I think what um <clears throat> Malia when you told us the story uh about um, the folks in Kahana and um, the, the sharing that you, of your great-grandfather with the fishermen who took too much or that he gave the rest. I think um, that is an art that um, we actually should be cultivating and looking for because you told a good story and that's Mo'olelo, and Mo'olelo just is so, it's almost like that knife, you know? And I mean, it's so precise and so effective, and, and that's a tool. And in a knockdown, drag out, you know, you're into all these court-ordered mediations and this master, that master, if we just had a master who could get up there and give that good story, it would it would solve a lot of problems because 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 sometimes you you got to get less to get it done. And so this even if it's an interest based format, it's the persuasion to shift from you know real kind of materialism to something else and you need the, that storyteller. So I think that was an example of how folks could give something up, give, or your grandfather, great grandfather, give up something of value, food, for the greater, because that neighbor wasn't going to do that again, you know, and, and that established a peace in a community. And so those are the good stories that 
if we could just translate them in our um, court, you know, in, into the all the things, because the, the judges want you to go and deal with it somewhere, somehow, show up later and have the deal done. I mean, it's not like you don't have the opportunity and you're not encouraged to do it. And it's just the how that, so that storytelling is, is awesome. That was great. And um, I think it really is about shifting how, our, how we teach our law students. You know, it's a shame that, I mean, at our law school, we only have John Barkey teaching alternative dispute resolution, but it, it should be like a requirement for every student. I don't think it's a requirement. Um, so students, I, I tend to see them, about, you know, in their second and third year, they're cynical. And they think the only way to deal with issues is through litigation. Um, but one of the things I found um, from my law students, you know, when they commented on the Kahana issue and as they helped me with the whale issue too was, one of the students said, um, you know, I was told that the pr profession of law is a healing profession. Um, and I never saw it until now. And so they, they have to see it, you know, they, they have to, um, they, they ha we have to have clinics around this. We have to, we have to do more um, in terms of teaching our attorneys to be healers too. And then we'll have the resources that Lalani is saying is badly needed. Um, but if you if you don't infuse that within them, if you don't tell them mo'olelo, if you don't show them that there's a there's another way to deal with this issue, these issues, then what are you gonna expect, you know, than just business as usual? And and I forgot to say in my great grandfather's story was actually another commercial fisherman had taken my great grandfather's fish but in the end he this other commercial fisherman said hey don't mess with you know because nets my great grandfather's name and so they ended up you know taking care of each other so um yeah and 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 i find that if if we can see each other as human beings then we tend to see each other as ohana and we take care of each other and i think I think that's what we're trying to aim for, you know. Yeah. If due to time, I think what I'll do is I'll merge a couple of the questions again. Um, so, and I think this is primarily Sean, but then also Evelyn has trust and land experience, and and as as does Malia. Uh, how would you address the following concern, where there's a contested case hearing? for permit issuance and the developer and certain parties lack a sensitivity to the culture uh, and there, there's an involvement of trust protections and obligations, constitutional, statutory, and case law uh, issues. There's also a, a similar question that uh, touches on that. It's, um, it's a question that has to do with how do we bridge or how do we create a, a, a stronger cultural connection? In other words, there seems to be a cultural insensitivity or a cultural divide where sometimes uh, the attorneys or the parties, their clients don't understand what's really at issue. Mm -hmm. Does that question make sense? Mm -hmm. So whoever it makes sense to, you can start answering. Thank you. You wanna go ahead, Euclid? So I think you, you well, um, I think sometimes it has to go down the road a bit, you know, spend a hundred grand and then we'll talk about it. Um, and seriously, what couldn't be resolved with the first proceed, you know, the first round, everyone's much more able to d deal with it. And then it comes down to trying to, and this is where the mo'olelo, because I don't, I don't always have access to mediators and things. You're just having to perform um, in maybe a court-appointed capacity. 
And you have to take that opportunity because a lot of times it's, it's Hawaiian people, you know, it's their inheritance, their land, and they're just hemorrhaging money. And so uh, we all got to talk about it and the, where it came from, your ancestor, and where are you going with all of this? But I don't have the good stories. And, and that would be a worthy workshop to have some mo'olelo. Um, or maybe it's just you're born with it, huh? <laughs> no, I had, I had a lot of cracks growing up from my dad <laughs> and my grandma. <laughs> you know? that, that's a tough question to answer because it's, it's presented where we are in, in the context that we are now. And the truth of the matter is this probably needed to be addressed well before now, meaning that the court has the ability and opportunity to lend legitimacy, to provide the kind of validity that an outsider, authority that an outsider might need to look at a process as, as legitimate by making the process something that's a part of the system as it is. And there's a real opportunity to do that in a place like this where you have so many people who are so connected to the culture in the first place. It's harder when you're in a spot where you, people aren't connected to the culture. Um, or and, you know, you're so lucky here to have so many people connected to the culture and also your land base, right? Not all indigenous people are on their land base. My people aren't on our land base anymore. We're in a different part of the country and it's Cherokee land, but that's not where we started. We got moved mm -hmm. and it changes your culture dramatically when the sky isn't the same anymore because you're in a different spot, where the trees are different because you're in a different spot, where the animals are different because you're in a different spot. So you're really lucky in this where you are here to be connected to your culture and to your actual land base. And the court has the opportunity to integrate this at, at a minimum for Hawaiian people, if not for the sort of non-natives here in a way that could lend legitimacy to it for people who aren't natives, who might look at a, a system that like this and say, oh, that's not legitimate, except that it's operating inside an institution that they already think is the authority, right? And so providing the opportunity to do that. And what, so what that means is by the time this developer, developer type question got to us, this process, the culture and the cultural aspects from it, the importance of the culture would just be integrated. It would be part of something that would be seen as valid and legitimate. And not that, it's not to imply that any indigenous people need some sort of validating authority or recognition from an outside authority. But I, I guess what I'm talking about is how do you persuade the non-native people that the, that the cultural process, that the native process is, is legitimate. And you do that by running it through the institutions that they already believe are legitimate. And so if there was a format here to be using that already, that could address some of this. Because part of that format is then, then you get lawyers who have to be attuned to the process and a minimum familiar with it if they don't respect it, right? Familiar with it in a way that it can be useful to them to serve their clients as their attorney ethics require them to do, right? So that's going to mean cultural sensitivity workshops and training for the lawyers, cultural knowledge workshops and trainings for the lawyers, and all those things translate into better better lawyering for people who, certainly for natives, but for people who are non-natives as these cases that type, cases, cases like the one described here pop up. Yeah, and I want to mention um, the Kahuleo Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law. I think about two or three times a year we do the um, boards and commission, state and county boards and commissions Native Hawaiian Law training. And I believe we're trying to expand it to also require um, agency people and maybe, I think, attorney general, state attorney general, those kind of people are also invited to these kinds of trainings. And it is the infusion of culture and law together. So those are, are good resources to look to. Can I say, too, that um, when we're dealing with these kinds of things, like permits and development projects and um, you know those kinds of legal cases that affect the community a lot um, I think that there are a few things that are very important in terms of aligning as best we can with um, with Pono and 
one of those things is, um, and this comes from ADR too, is it's important to get out of the mentality of compromise. That is very, very important because when those kinds of influences and those kinds of situations come into our community, a lot of times the solutions that are proposed have to do with compromise. Uh, you know, they come from a, a concept of compromise and they don't work. In fact, they generally make it worse. And, um, you know, I'll just use the... Um, the idea, for example, you know, and I don't know if this is a good example, but, um, you know, the proposal of a peace park on Mauna Kea, for example, you know, it's very important that while something like that, it might seem like a, a good way to try to bring some kind of peace to a very contentious situation, but unfortunately, it doesn't help in fact it inflames the situation further and it again this comes down to the oya eo truth that that is what you need to work with you need to work with that and you need to work with the restoration of the flow of real aloha you know and it may be that people have different positions they may have very different positions and there may be no easy way to reconcile those positions. And that is what you're working with. When you are working with Evi Kupuna, there will never be a compromise on a person's ancestors. You know, there's, there's no way that there will be a way to make a development project Pono when it is sitting on top of somebody's great, 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 great grandfather. You know, it just, that's not going to happen. And even when the, if the, it can go through the whole court system and that's, it's not going to, um, it's, it's not going to resolve until you can actually bring the whole situation to a place of Pono. And I'm not saying that can't be done. It can be done. You know, I work on a lot of um, helping people with exit strategies. You know, honestly, that's, that's, a, that's very important work that needs to happen. And um, because it's once the truth is understood and that's the other part of the question right what what happens when things are just not understood the same you know and and Euclid is right that a lot of times through that spending of hundreds of thousands of dollars people start to gain understanding of what the situation is but often they're so deep in it they can't let it go they're not in a position of making the decision to let it go and so it's a very complicated situation to deal with. And so from a cultural perspective, we're there trying to nonetheless bring healing, bring opening of the heart, bring, you know, bring those things together, you know, and at the same time, make no mistake about it, we're also helping people to strengthen themselves to fight too because there is no way to bring that healing unless that, um, that Pono can be achieved. And, you know, Pono in our um, concept, and I think it's beyond a Kanaka thing, I think it's probably indigenous peoples worldwide and, and, and elsewhere, you know, Pono, rightness, it's, it's like the sun, it doesn't move. It can take different forms, but it, it's there, you know? And it is a matter of aligning ourselves with that. And so because of that, um, you know, it, it means very honestly looking at all of those 
very real situations, not just one side, it's another side. I mean, we can talk to a developer about, um, you know, the on, on their side, they may need to look at the very real impacts that in there is no way of mitigating. There is just simply no way. And that is the real simple truth that you cannot get around. And on the other side, we may need to look to it, how we're treating people. You know, how are we treating people in our own communities who, um, you know, may be taking positions that hurt our aloha. You know, our, our aloha may get hurt when, for example, someone, a cousin is offered a job with this developer, you know, and is now defending them because they need the money, honestly because that's they're trying to survive and it's hard to survive here and so you know in terms of that resolution we're dealing with a lot of that and we cannot achieve pono unless we can be honest really really honest to that oya eo level about all of it all of it thank you i'm gonna i'm going to take that moment as a part of this, what is the takeaway from this conversation, right? And and that that's sort of like the essence of what what we were trying to talk about here, which is it's really hard. And this intersection is requiring us to look at the whole the whole process differently and to really honor the indigenous process, the, the whole pono pono, honor that seeking of healing. Um, I'm taking away one of the things that you know, in my past life, I read thousands, literally, of um, admission applications to law school. That was one of my things to do. And I know for a quantitative fact that most people go to law school because they are seeking to be healers. And I had the privilege of working with Wade um, on a project called Ho'oponomamo, which, in, in which he works with young people who have offended and helps them become healers. So how powerful, and it, that's my takeaway from this conversation. I really appreciate that in learning, learning how to be a healer and learning how to look at that differently. So I'm just really, we're, we're, we're down to like a minute and a half in the takeaway, but if I could just ask each of you to, to share your takeaway with this. I guess, uh, I mean, I would just say, just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. You know, and Hawaiian style is if you're going to do a kapulu job, if you're going to be messy and you, you're going to, you know, you're just going to do a half kind of job, don't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, so to me, if we came here to talk about Ho'oponopono and how can we create a, a, you know, restore justice and make people whole, then let's commit to doing it all the way, not a kapulu job, you know? So that's what I have to say. Thank you. I think my takeaway really is the, the art of the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And uh, Haku actually also can be a storyteller, you know, when you, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the meaning of the word, like Haku Mele. And the other is the truth. Because we sometimes um, forget that part, you know, in the interest of settling or resolution or ending this traumatic litigation. And so I think that's the two takeaways. <clears throat> so I... I I say two very cynical things to my students. Um, one is something that was told to me, and I tell them that this isn't true. But and it brings me to to what you were talking about before, which is, and well, both of you really, which is, if if you're right that most of the students are going into law school because they want to be healers, um, and you're right that by the time they're two L's and three L's, which I also see, they are super cynical and and. We can all see the result of having gone through law school, right? Which is this. Here we are, right?
right? We, we're sitting in this huge room. We go through these processes. Um, so I guess maybe my takeaway would, would, would be this. Um, it, what we're doing is not working. It's just not. There's not a study that shows that, both from an outcomes perspective, both from an expense perspective, and when you do surveys of the people going through the process, they're not satisfied with it either. Uh, so what we're, it's not working. So let's just do something else. And why not do the something else that has, up until it sort of got taken away from us, had proven itself to be something that healed people, that kept communities together, that brought us closer. Uh, it's more difficult now because we have become a society that's been integrated through force and now through habit, and we've changed in lots of ways, but we're all still here, which means we survived. Mm -hmm. That means all the, all the people on this island survived. My people survived, right? We started in the southeast. We made a really long walk to Oklahoma, and we survived. And that means someone along the way had to survive so that my mom could be alive to have me. Somebody along the way had to survive so that my grandmother could be alive to have my mother. Uh, I had to survive so that and then all those folks before me so that I could have my daughter, right? So we are people who have survived, which means we understand how to keep what's sacred to us, but we also understand how to adapt. And we've reached a sort of crossroads now where we have the opportunity, if we will just be smart enough to do it, to adapt. So I would say the takeaway is what we're doing isn't working. So you might as well try something else. Well, the, the takeaway that I get from this, um, you know, and first of all, the takeaway from the questions is that there is a very strong interest here in developing something better. You know, that, that, that interest exists. It exists here in Hawaii. It exists worldwide, you know, and, and that, um, that, that we're here and we can, we can do that. So, you know, I definitely, I think there's, there's a takeaway that comes from each of the, um, the folks here, you know, from Malia, I think her, her mo'olelo about the fish is, is a wonderful example of how personal responsibility, you know, and, and giving that, that, those values, you know, that, um, we don't see that are often forgotten, you know, but they're there. They've come from our kupuna. They're, they're there. And those are the things that we can draw from and we need to be able to draw from, you know, and not have them be blocked out by this other kind of mentality that's, that's set in. And, you know, those are the same things that Auntie Lynette Paglino wanna really want to acknowledge her presence being here because even though she hasn't said anything, she's, um, you know, we have a real haku ho'oponopono here who has, you know, decades and decades of practice, you know, and, and um, you know, who I've worked, I've had the honor of working with in training even young opio in those concepts and sometimes karate and opio, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, who are able to learn from her as a kupuna and you know so that value is still here and it's still so important and um you know from Euclid pointing out that the value of storytelling is important and what it takes to get there sometimes it takes hundreds of thousands of dollars you know to to get there you know and talking about how this is practiced in other places and the Yes, we are the people who've, who've survived. We've survived incredible hardships. We're struggling to survive today, but we are, we're here and we're passing it on. And that's what's really important. And humanity is at a point of where the survival of people is in question. And bringing this, bringing these practices, bringing this, um, change in mentality to light may just be that key to that survival. So thank you everybody for, for listening and for participating and for our panelists. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you everyone.